live. Page one. First Chronicles, Romans 3, says, understand the present time. Now, the next section, see where the underline the clearest passage of the season when Jesus will return 70 years from 1967 to 2037. Do me a favor and put your papers down. Let me explain this real clearly. I was raised non-Christian. I was a persecutor of Christians and very, very cynical. I still approach the interpretation of the word of God from a very scientific, logical, cynical perspective. Therefore, 99% of all the end times predictions I hear on a zero to 100 scale have legitimacy below a five. It's a lot of puff, a lot of smoke. I hear people say irrational things like, the Bible says that Israel becoming a nation is the mark of the end. It doesn't say that. No one even knows. It's a very obscure verse. I think it's in Ezekiel that says, well, when they come, then day there'll be another land. I mean, it's so vague. And so when I approach end time stuff, I do it from a logical, scientific, cynical perspective on the interpretation. With that, this is not a small fact to me. Old Testament, hundreds of prophecies about the first coming of the Messiah, but only one prophecy that gave the exact timeline. How many are aware of this fact? Everything else is vague, hundreds of them, but in Daniel chapter 9, the angel came to Daniel and said, I'm going to tell you the exact day that when the Messiah will come. All this was written, recorded, and provable hundreds of years before Christ came. The angel said to Daniel, in your future, there will be a king. He will give the order to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. From the day that order is given, the clock starts. You count forward 483 years and the Messiah will come. And that date recorded in history hundreds of years before Jesus came, Cyrus gave the order, and you count forward 483 years to the day and that is the day that Jesus on Palm Sunday rode into Jerusalem and that's why no Jewish rabbi will discuss Daniel 9 with any Christian because a first grader can read it and that's another one of my tests I don't need something well what it really means I need a, a first grader needs to be able to read it and say well isn't it obvious in the New Testament there are hundreds of prophecies about the return of Christ However, there's only one that very specifically gives the exact season. In Luke 21, Jesus said, when the Gentiles recapture Jerusalem, that's when the time of, I mean, when the Jews recapture Jerusalem, that's when the times of the Gentiles is over. And he said, those that are alive to see the Jews recapture Jerusalem, some of that generation will be alive to see me return in the clouds. Now, a generation is 40, 70, or 100 years. So when I say 70 years is 20, 30, 70, it could be 100 years. There could still be people that were born in 1966 that are alive in 2067. And so um, 70 years is the most common, but that's not guaranteed. All that we're guaranteed is in 1967, the Six Days War, the clock started. Our time is over, which is why right after that, the murder of Dr. King, Bobby Kennedy, Woodstock, which is the, the, considered the explosion of free sex, free love. Across, you look across history, when did free sex, free love start? They say the Woodstock concert. That's historically the moment it started. All happened after 1967. And it's been going straight downhill. So that's the time when the Lord said, this is the season when I turn over my people to the control of the enemy for the final purification for my return. 1967. In all of that, what I'm about to tell you, I want you to mark down the date. See where it says the date, a third of the way down the left? It's February 2014. Because the things I'm about to tell you, on a zero to 100 scale, how sure am I about the 1967 thing? I'm 80s, 90s. The thing I'm about to tell you now, how sure am I a 99? What I'm about to tell you will happen. The only shocking thing is that it has not, not, has not already happened. Within five to 15 years, the tax-exempt status will be removed from all Bible-believing churches. Now, I beg of you, do not be an irrational person who talks before thinking. Hear me clearly. I, hear, I say this to people, and they have all these you know, reactions of, oh, I don't care, and besides, the Constitution guarantees, you know, that I get, no, no, no. The First Amendment of the Constitution guarantees the free exercise of religion. Tax-exempt status is a government subsidy of churches and nonprofit. Tax-exempt status is a government what? 
subsidy. It's the government giving us money. That's what it is. It's only been around for 100 years, by the way. There was no tax-exempt status till the early 1900s. It only evolved into what it is to the 1930s or 40s. Within five to 15 years, here's exactly what's going to happen. The cases have already been written. Honestly, I really think that they're just waiting till the next presidential election to decide when to pursue this case. I could win this case, and I'm not a lawyer. Once you go to the courts, it will not be handled in Congress or legislature. It will be handled through the courts. And so you file a lawsuit against the United States government saying that this law is unconstitutional because it denies civil rights. And you argue before the courts. You say, Your Honor, it has been proven in numerous court recordings, already precedent, that homosexuals are born that way. Therefore, it's a civil right. And our entire constitution is based on the pursuit of life, liberty, and guaranteeing civil rights. Your Honor, I'm not saying to shut down all the haters. Goodness knows our constitution gives them the right to have their hateful religion. I am saying, why are we paying them money? And I, all I'm asking, Your Honor, is strike down this, this incredibly unconstitutional law that subsidizes people who violate civil rights. It'll be a, a slam dunk. Again, all the pieces are already in place. We have four or five lawyers in our church. Everyone's come up to me afterwards and said, yeah, the only thing I'm surprised it hasn't happened yet. It's going to happen. And again, if I understand strategies, it's probably waiting until the next presidential election to decide the political climate because it's already in place to have happen. When it happens, and again, this is not a time to be bluff and bluster and try to be impressive through pontification. This is a time to be humble and alert and clear-headed. Don't bluff, don't freak out. But I hear people say, oh, I don't care if they take my tax exempt status away. You're missing the whole point. I started with this point. I said, for the first time in the history of the United States of America, 100% of America has focused in not on Christians, but on that very small, distinct group called Bible believing Christians. Those who believe that all the Bible is the Word of God. And that group is resented or hated. After this 501c3 status is removed, that group is now legally distinct. So the court strikes down 501c3. Within one week, a new 501c3 law will be written because United Way, all the big boys, use uh, this 501c3 nonprofit. And Congress will come together and say, we've been rebuked by the courts. Okay, let's rewrite this thing. You, all you have to do is sign this thing that's an affidavit that says, as a nonprofit organization, we agree to never discriminate upon anyone upon their sexual orientation. And if there's 350, there's about 350,000 churches in America, 332,000 of them or some incredibly high number will sign it immediately. And the only ones that don't sign it are those that say, wait a minute, what this says is I have to welcome a practicing homosexual into membership, I have to be willing to perform homosexual weddings. I can't base my church on the Bible as the word of God and do that. And so it won't sign it. Now you say, what will happen then? What will happen is you won't be able to go to church without picket lines. It'll start as protest lines. You'll never again invite a guest to church because your guest is not, you know, you're going to be signs out haters, haters, cult haters group, and they'll be videotaping. They'll be taking your license plates and taking pictures. They'll be going to your neighbors. They'll be going to your bosses and say, you realize this worker of yours, he works for a, a hate cult. You gonna let someone like that work for you? And the persecution will ramp up a whole nother level. Protest lines will eventually become picket lines. The difference between a protest line and a picket line is when the police back a picket line, they can block entrance and the police won't remove you. So from that point, things get really, really, really intense. And there's the trigger, the legal trigger that now has made Bible-believing Christians a distinct legal group. From that, if you look at your handout, somewhere between 10 and 30 years from now, it will be illegal for Bible-believing churches to meet in public. Once they're a distinct legal group, the, mun the municipalities take over and they start changing zoning laws. And all you have to do is change enough zoning laws and you simply make it illegal for all the churches to meet. It'll happen slowly. Now, uh, this is where we start to get to some really good news. Y'all ready for some good news? Yes. Number one, we're not going to face physical torture. I really don't see that and I'll explain why in a minute. Number two... At that time, and we already have a plan in place, and by the way, I am teaching this exact same message this summer at a pastor's conference and making this material available to other pastors, because when, as soon as that court case begins to work its way through 
the court system, we will institute plan A of our plan. And that is, we are going to go to home cell church. And what we'll do is, at that point, as soon as the court case is public, because there's no way it cannot win, all of our co-pastors will take on a dual role. So currently our co-pastors oversee one service. At this point, for a period of one to two years, they will oversee one service and one geographic area. And so you have the co-pastors over the Sunday 10 service who also oversee the Ackworth area. And what will happen is, and we'll have our elders trained by this year, all of our small group leaders trained by next year, and we'll simply start meeting three weekends a month here, one weekend a month in the home. And home cell churches is how they've done it for, for a long time in China. And with the internet, even if they take away the internet, we can do it through DVDs. Uh, and then eventually as the persecution gets intense, and it will get intense quicker in California and Oregon and Washington and New England. So we'll see when the picket lines start to get vicious and things happen. And we'll accelerate according to it. Then we'll meet twice a month here. And eventually we'll sell the building. We'll rent a little office building where we can have our CD lending library and our bookkeeping and stuff like that. You'll still be a part of Liberty Church. I'll do a video teaching each week. In fact, since I'm only teaching, uh, you know, one thing a weekend, it'll probably be a 20-minute teaching. I'll probably teach more over the course of the year. Um, but you'll get the video teaching. You'll have all the CD learning libraries. Short courses are going to be immensely important. We still have a lot to work out. Like, I really think short courses are going to be more valuable when you're in, in a home church situation. You'll still have elders. You'll still have counseling ministries available. But the point is, the days of witnessing are over. The days of bringing friends to church are over, and there's going to be a time that we're going to, our goal will be deepening our walk with the Lord and surviving. So there's a very clear plan. Our conclusions are, uh, number one, praise the Lord, I do not see us facing physical torture. Can someone say amen to that? Amen. Listen, I'll be as brave as the Lord wants me to, but I am not minding if he's going to let me out of some things, okay? Um, because the epicenter of God is always the Middle East, and we're just the edges. But more importantly, uh, do you know why we're not going to face physical torture? Because us renouncing Christ is not Satan's goal. And Satan is smart enough to know that throughout history, whenever he physically tortured Christians, it tended to reverberate back on him. And people felt sorry for the Christians and began to become Christians. Satan's goal has never been us. To this day, it's not us. Satan's goal is the middle group of people. It used to be 80% of America who basically believe in Jesus and believe in the Bible. Now hear me clearly. The Bible says that when you renounce part of the Bible as the word of God, you've renounced Jesus. The Bible says, we're a package deal. I, this is all the word of God or not. And then it says in John 1 that Jesus is the word. So the target is not us. The target is all those sort of Christians who say, well, those poor homosexuals, I mean, they're born this way and all these evil people, and who cares what that verse, now, just, you know, it's not all word. And, and, and to get you to renounce the word as the whole word of God is to renounce Jesus. That's who he's going after. He's going after the weak ones, the middle ground ones, and he's really happy with us just to shut us up and isolate us. And so that's where we're going. Now, what happens, every, one of the questions you're going to ask me, by the way, we're about to get into questions in just a minute. I'm going to have you write down four things, then we're going to take questions. Um, a lot of questions, save, save time. I don't, I don't know about the tri tri tribulation. I mean, I know it's a seven-year period, and I don't know it out of, it's not that I don't know out of ignorance. I've studied as much as anyone. I understand pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, and pan-trib. And pan-trib is it all pan out in the end. I don't know, though. <laughs> I just don't know. And, and, I, and, and if I can't go to something where I'm over 80% certain, I just like, it's a distraction to me. I don't know about the mark of the beast, so don't even ask that kind of stuff. But what I do know uh, in these conclusions is, number two, praise the Lord that with the persecution already beginning, the Bible-believing body of Christ is already dropping petty arguments and seeking the Lord's heart more than any time in my lifetime. 20 years ago, how many Bible-believing churches did you know that were fasting? Any? Right now, do you know any Bible-believing church that's not fasting? 20 years ago, all these petty, stupid doctrines and, and all this immorality, and it's all been rinsed out. And the, as the persecution increases, the heart is just, I just want to love you, Lord. And so good things are happening. Number three, live daily for Jesus. See the foreclosure illustration thing there? How many of you have known someone who's had their house foreclosed on? Put your hands up. 
I've known over 50 people. And let me tell you, there's a phase one, shock, depression, anger. And then if you'll seek the Lord, there's a phase two of contentment and appreciation for everything you have. So let's just go ahead and work through phase one now before it happens, okay? Let's go ahead and work through all of our shock and anger and depression and already start getting to the fact, which we're going to pray in a few minutes. You know, thank God we're going to have a church family. And we're, thank God we're, we're not going to see our kids tortured. Thank God that we have answers to answer with gentle, respectful ways those who ask us questions. Um, bond deeply with your church family. Let me say this. Some of you, you take the word of God very seriously. And every book in the New Testament says your number one charge from Jesus is love your church like family. Because when the time comes that we're separated and scattered somewhat, it's the relationships that you invested in for five, 10 years. It'll be your safest relationships. You tracking with me? So if this happens quicker, and as I said before, I've never been wrong on a prediction. Did you know that? A political prediction? But there's a reason why. I kind of cheat. Whenever I see something happening, I look at the realistic time frame of when it will happen and multiply it times about four, and that's my prediction. So I always make predictions way out, so it always happens in less time than I predicted, so I keep my track record clear. <laughs> I've been doing this since the 70s. I've predicted things. I've actually predicted every presidential win since the 70s. It's always the best, the best looking, most charming man. <laughs> always is. Every presidential election, give me the best looking, most charming man, that's the one who wins. So I don't know if that'll happen next time, but that's happened every time. In all this, I could be wrong. We might not have five years. If it happens this year, and again, I'm pretty sure we got till the next presidential election, but if it happens this year and two years from now, you don't get Sheila's worship anymore, and you don't get the free childcare, and you don't get the break through the joy with all the, in, in the small group rooms, how much will you miss it? Well, live today the way you wish you had lived after it's gone. Get involved in short courses. Don't play games with this little two minutes of prayer a day. By, within a year, be spending an hour a day in the word or prayer. Seek the Lord like you've never sought him before. And the goal of this document, number seven, is help our people to understand the truth in our own hearts and to give you a shield against harassment. Bunch of scriptures there on hating Jesus without logic, not letting our love grow cold and giving gentle answers. But I want you to write down four things to do. After you write down these four things, I'm going to repeat, I'm begging you, when you raise your hand, and I'll repeat your question, don't give me any backstory. Get one sentence, say, my question is, and just give the question, because we have 20 to 30 questions every service. Four things I want you to write down. Number one, children. I've had so many parents say, you told me to talk about this to my kids. My kids talk about this to me all the time. I have not had a reasoned, loving, biblical response. Thank you. But if you've not talked about it with your kids, they're hearing it at five years old. And so they need to have your understanding that the real issue is, do you love them? Because if you love them, you wouldn't condemn them to this is your only option for the rest of your life. Number two, respond. Meaning... You don't have to go out and witness to people anymore. They're chasing you down. I mean, there might be an angry mob chasing you down, <laughs> but they are chasing you down. <laughs> so you have a season of time where you're able to say, look, I'll answer your questions if you'll read this thing. Don't debate. If you'll read this thing and then just hear my heart and just keep your mind on one thing because I love them. I want the person to want to have a choice. The third thing I want you to write down is legal. Now, you're going to ask me some questions. I'm going to save you some time. But people say, well, you know, I get all these legal situations. Uh, obviously, we all know about people losing their license because they won't serve homosexuals. And, and it's just going to get worse. You're going to lose a lot of jobs. You're going to lose a lot of situations. But you can minimize it with wisdom. The number one thing right now is if in most corporate America, if you said, well, I, I think homosexuality is a sin, you will lose your job. If someone says, what do you think about homosexuality? I think it's a sin. You will lose your job. So that's already happened. That's already established policy. And in all that, there is a better answer. It is a more biblical answer. It's more in the heart of God. So what do you think about homosexuals? Homosexuals, I love them. I love them. I don't just love them. I, and I'm serious. I like them. They're the coolest people I've ever met. How many of you have some very dear friends who are homosexual? Put your hands up. Am I right? They're creative, gifted, funny, artistic, fascinating, deep thinking, caring people. And so when some, I love them, I, lo I love them and I like them. It's also a legally smart answer. 
So understand, it's not a lot of legal protection, but it is some, because it's truth, it's a good thing. Uh, number four is the prayer, not prayer, the prayer. And again, I'm going to take questions, your one sentence questions, but in my book, Confidence in Heaven, which is basically a study of the subject of repentance, in that I say, you've crossed the line as a Christian when every time things go wrong, you pray the prayer that never fails. God, use this pain to dig deeper wells of your love through me to others. So let's get past all the grief. I've lost my house. It's foreclosed on my house. I'm so angry. I'm so depressed. Let's get past the focus on what we've lost and focus on what we've gained and focus on the fact that we have a weapon. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the, love. the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Okay, raise your hand. Give me your one sentence. My question is. Yes. Great question, Kim. I don't know. Uh, I started everything with my kids at five. I talked to my kids about everything. I was taking my kids counsel on sensitive issues at five years old. And you know, they were like, I don't know and I don't care. But I was at least ahead of the curve, you know. So they always knew they could come to me. Yes. Okay, I want to answer that question. The question is, how come homosexuality became this big sin? Do you understand the phrase propaganda? Okay, there was a propaganda movement against us. It was not Christians who birthed that. There's no, in fact, what's really funny, I had a college professor come up to me after 8 o'clock. She said, I'm a Christian. They know it. And I have Christians that almost every semester that stand up and just rail against those hateful Bible believers, those hateful Bible believers. If you ever ask these people who rail against, can you tell me the names of the individual hateful? Uh, no. I, and what happens is they saw it on TV. It's exactly where they got that information. So, yes, in the 70s, I saw some hateful Christians who'd stand outside gay bars and just call them, you know, the, the demons of hell. I saw a little bit of it in the 80s. I saw none of it in the 90s. I've seen none of it in the last 12, 15 years. So, are there Christians out there who are demonizing homosexuality as a terrible thing? No, not one anywhere. Now, there are some Christians who are tired of being hammered, who are reacting back. Why do you think it's... Well, yes, it's a sin. And they're responding to anger with anger, which is not wise. But that entire concept is a 100% fabrication to isolate. So you try to name the Christians you know that walk around looking to attack homosexuals. And you can't find them. You will find that 99.9% .9 of the Christians are scared and ducking and afraid because we're getting hammered all the time. So it's important to sort out truth from propaganda. Next question. Alex. Okay, let me, let me rephrase your question to two other questions. One is, uh, people have been asked me, would you ever receive a practicing homosexual into a membership of Liberty Church? And... When, whether it's homosexuality or someone's a liar or complaining, because all sins being sin, selfishness, when do I walk in forgiveness and draw closer to the person? So if I may answer both of those, membership in a church body is this concept, the ecclesia, the called out ones, the word church, means those who've gathered together. When you join Liberty Church, the first and biggest commitment you make is I will live my life only for Jesus Christ and base my life totally on the Bible as the word of God. So as an example, we have, and I said we have like 30 to 40 people who are formerly in homosexuality who are members of Liberty Church. Some of them still struggle. Some have still fallen back into sin, repent. We walk them through. Um, but a much higher percentage is uh, pornography. I deal with pornography. I don't go a week without dealing with people who are dealing with pornography. But I've had a few rare times where someone says, yeah, I like pornography, but I still want to be a member. And I say, well, you can't because the Bible says and the most common thing is I've never had a month in the history of Liberty Church that someone, two people living together, didn't want to become members of Liberty Church. It's almost like nice when you go a week. And, and, and we're always gentle and respectful. And I always, I say, no, my pastors can handle this. I'll handle this personally. And I'll say, I want to win your heart. I want to get to know you. Please understand, we'd love for you to come here. But our whole gathering is based on living by the Bible. And if I could walk with you through, and, and I usually just start with something gentle, like, do you think it's okay with God? Well, no, we know we're in sin. And so that's our most common thing. So yes, practicing 
homosexuality. It's, I'm going to do this no matter what. So we will never have someone that's practicing any aspect of sexual morality to become part of Liberty Church. The next question is, what about my relationship with people? Three answers, and I know it's a lot, but this, we're going to record this, and so you'll have this. Number one, the Bible says that you forgive everyone every time of everything, whether they're repentant or not. You tracking with me? And Jesus talked about this very fiercely in Matthew. He says, you've sinned, they've sinned this against you. What have you sinned against God? So when someone lies against you, hates you, you know, and, and, and just is continuing to lie and attack you, you forgive them because Jesus forgave you. Someone say amen. amen. Second is, you're not supposed to trust them. So trusting someone does not mean that you give that blankly. The Bible says if your brother sins against you, for, uh, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. And especially 1 Corinthians 4, 2 says, now it's required those who've been given a trust must prove faithful. So if someone is a complainer and they want to be closer to you and they say, I really want to stop this complaining and I realize it's poisoning our friendship, you give them like a stair step, a little bit of trust and then they earn it. You give them a little more trust. So relationship with anyone who's walking in unrepentant sin is based upon repentance. So trust and relationship. Third answer is you don't have to have a relationship with someone to give to them. I have people come in all the time. Well, I can't join the church because I don't know if I trust anybody. And I say, you don't have to trust people to give. So your, your, your homosexual friends are having a baby christening for adopting their baby. You're not supporting homosexuality by saying, I'm happy for you. This is, this is a good thing that, you know, you want to be a parent. So friendship, relationship, forgiveness, and just giving to someone, which is not compromising your moral stance, are three separate subjects. In the midst of all of that, though, the issue is that individual person if they're in homosexuality, in anything. People who complain all the time, they have seasons where they hate themselves because they're just whiny complainers. And in that moment, you want to say you have a choice. That's what love is. Love says you have a choice. Next question. What do I think the thought process is? The, the thought process of... All right, the Bible says they hated Jesus without logic. And the closer we get to end times, the less logic there is. So it, if you're looking for a process, the assumption there is what is the logical process? There is no logical process. Emotions dominate logic. Say that for me. Emotions So for a pedophile who has been molested, and I'm going to go and tell you the psychological issue. The only time they feel safe and valued is when they're molesting a child. Because... It's familiar, it's comfortable, and the child is safe, and it's pleasurable. I realize that there's no logic and no truth to that, but you asked me what's going on in their emotions is really what you asked. And so for that person, for them to say, Jesus said you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free, there is a processing of truth versus what is driving me. It happens with every person in every sin pattern. I'm going to take two or three more questions and wrap it up. Just the question. Go ahead, go ahead, John. Great question. Uh, I call this the Kenneth Hagin rule. The question is, if someone says, do you think homosexuality is wrong, what's so bad about me giving you an honest answer? You can do that. You'll simply enhance the propaganda and they'll walk away saying, oh, see, I just proved, you know, all you Christians are haters. I call it the Kenneth Hagin rule. Anybody ever loved Kenneth Hagin's teaching? Well, Kenneth Hagin did one major mistake, and I'm really convinced of this. He said, I'm not responsible for what people hear when I teach. <laughs> Do you remember him saying that? He's wrong. You are responsible for what people hear when you speak. And in that, when you say, yeah, I think it's a sin, all they're hearing is, you hate him, don't you? That's the only, you think it's the only sin. You, you have to kill him and destroy them. So what I do is what I'm asking you to say is, I will answer your question if you'll first do me a favor and read this. And then they come back and they say, so you do think it's a sin? And if you're, if you're at all good with communication, you'll say, 
I think everybody's in sin. I think the whole world, apart from Jesus Christ, is trapped in sin. So I would refuse to feed the propaganda. And I'm trying to give you an answer that changes the subject to, can we talk about the love of God? And, and I like to turn it around, because what I do with someone is I ask them to read this, and then I will say to them, I will answer your questions if you'll answer mine. So they answer that first question, well, do you think it's a sin? Uh, well, I think everybody is in sin, and this is uh, one thing as, uh, as are all the earth of sins. Yes, my turn, because I always want to ask my turn. My question, do you have friends who are homosexual? And if you do, because that's not the question, if you have friends who are homosexual and you've listened to them enough, you know that some of them don't want to be homosexual anymore. Do you hate them so much to say, too bad, so sad, you're stuck, or do you love them enough to care that they have another option? Because this person who's attacking me, I gotta tell you something else, it's not homosexuals attacking Christians. It's not. It is the offended non-homosexuals who rant and rave the most. You will find that one-on-one -on -one, homosexuals are generally very gracious, accepting people. So what happens is this, this attacking group, they don't love homosexuals. And I like to point that out. Isn't that a politically correct? If, if in fact the person had asked... Um, for, the, for the tape, because it's, it's all dead now. So your question is, the political correct answer is, is you're asking... To that, to that question. Right. Um, had oh, is it sin? Ask if, um, if a murder, if somebody commits a murder, is that sin? Yes. Wouldn't the, correct, wouldn't the answer be yes? Yes. <laughs> the politically correct answer is the one I gave. Yes, I believe that everyone on the earth is in sin. That is, the, the, when I say politically correct, I'm only willing to give a politically correct answer if it's also truth. So if you're going to ask me what other answers do you believe homosexuality is a sin, my first response is, will you first read this? Second is, yes, I think that everyone is in sin. And so you're going to be pinned down at some point where they're going to trap you and say, so you do believe homosexuality is a sin. The answer is yes. The Bible is very clear on that. But your goal is to win a heart. That's why I said you could win the heart of half the people. But the bottom line is, more than anything else, your own heart. The love of most will grow cold. If you walk away loving that person, loving the attacker, then you're closer to Jesus through this. All right, I need to ask everyone to stand and join hands. You don't have to have two hands, but have at least one person's hand you're holding. That way you won't stretch people too far. All right, now look me in the eyes, please. I'm begging you to, to engage your heart in this. We are a very blessed people. We have a Lord Jesus who is pouring out his spirit and his love and his truth on us. He has taken our shameful, pitiful, selfish, blind selves and opened our eyes to our own need for him. Second, he has given us a love for other people. He's given us a church family. We're in one of the least persecuted areas and we have the privilege now of choosing to say, as the attacks increase, so shall the love of God increase in my heart. So I want you to leave here to say, saying, thank you, Lord, for all the good things in my life. And I'm going to, every time I'm stressed, I want to pray this prayer. I want you to say these words. Say, in the name of Jesus Christ, of Jesus Christ. I have the greatest weapon the greatest in all eternity. All I have the love of God love of in my heart, in my heart. and through my heart. through my heart. And by the promises of God's word, of God. when, stress comes, when stress comes, when pain comes, I will pray the prayer that never fails. I will embrace the pain and say, Lord Jesus, use this pain to dig deeper wells of your love through me to others, to your glory with every ounce of my being. In Jesus' precious name, would you give the Lord a praise offering and tell him you love him? Love you, Lord. We love